Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Bunny Hugs and Mental Health here on YouTube. Uh, I, I've been gone for the summer. I'm back, and so are my guests. Uh, it's been a wacky, wacky summer. Uh, I've moved cities. Uh, my youngest son graduated high school. I lost somebody that was very dear to me, and um, I, I, I miss her dearly, and... Uh, so this might sound cheesy, but I'm going to do it anyway. I'm dedicating this episode to you, Denise. Um, she was my mother-in-law, and she was just my biggest cheerleader, huge supporter, best grandmother ever, and just a wonderful, wonderful person. So uh, anyway, uh, this episode is a, with Francesca R Reikerter. I don't know if I'm saying her last name right. Sorry, Francesca, but uh, she is just a, a wonderful, sweet girl who has, um, she's had all types of mental health problems in the past, including a suicide attempt. Uh, but now she's an advocate and she created a, a non-for-profit called Inspiring My Generation. And she has a podcast. Uh, I believe it's also called that. Uh, so anyway, here's, a, here's a, a nice interview with a nice girl about mental health stuff. How are you doing? You're I'm done school. Good. Yeah, so I'm done for the summer, so it's really good. I've kind of entered into a depressive episode on Sunday, so doing oh. my best to smile and have some kind of energy and just wait for it to get better and do what I can. Was but that other scheduled? Than the depressive episode sounds yeah. like it, right? <laughs> like on Sunday. <laughs> no, it uh, on Sunday. It was, uh, it's so hard. And like, you know, I know what triggers it. I thought I was doing everything I could to prevent it. I didn't, apparently. And it just happens. And it's something that, you know, is that ongoing kind of journey that it never gets 100% better. And you can just do what you can and manage it the way you can. So. Yes, I hear you about when you do feel like junk and you know, like, I mean, you're an advocate, you know, everything you're, you're supposed to be doing, but uh, I know once it hits us, it's still, you still, you do all the things that you tell people not to do. <laughs> yeah, you do. And it's so frustrating because you know, the warning signs, you know what you should be doing. You know the triggers, and it's like you just sometimes ignore it, sometimes think you're doing enough, and just are kind of like, you know, when like you're in love and you're blinded by love. It's like that, basically, for your mental health. <laughs> and, I mean. The brain just, wants what the brain wants. Yeah, and then you just <laughs> got to get through it the best way that you can with what you know how, so. I've started, yeah. I'm playing with my hair a lot. So you can tell that's when I'm more like having anxious because I never touch my hair. And now I have not been able to stop for the past 24 mm. hours. Um, and my necklace. Don't know why I do that when I'm anxious, but it happens. I have a mustache <laughs> to do that with. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> but now I've started, so I have my whiteboard in front of me and it has like an affirmation, gratitude, self-care practice, what I'm looking forward to, a song and a quote. And I just put the template on there and I've been doing it for the last two days. So we're on day two. Um, and that's kind of helping because it's just a way to start my day. That's like an affirmation I'm going to tell myself when I'm feeling bad and a self-care practice I'm going to do, something that I'm grateful for and looking forward to. So it kind of guides my day a bit. And then a song I can listen to to just connect how I'm feeling. And so far, it's okay. It's going well. Well, good. I mean... I mean, that's probably more than what you used to do, right? Like even even though I do all the stuff I tell people not to do, I'm still much more self-aware and, you know, I I don't spiral for as long and for as bad as I used to. So I don't know. It's okay. almost like our bodies need to do some of the stuff we tell people not to do. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. but it's the progress of it's not as bad and it's more manageable where you know what you can do. And I think that's the beauty of it because again, it's like this never ending process and there's going to be ups and downs, but the more you go through it, the more tools you learn, the more aware you become. And 
Hopefully it gets just a tad bit easier to recognize, identify, and start working on. And sometimes it may feel impossible and hopefully you have that support system that really, really, my support system, they just, they get it and it's great. And the more our support systems can see the warning signs too. And so that, uh, mm-hmm. you know, they're more available or, or I have a friend that calls it a canary, um, you know, like miners used to have canaries in the tunnels and you know when the canary died you knew to get out of there so our support systems are a bit like a canary where they can start to see the warning signs before we even do sometimes and and say hey buddy uh you've been uh practicing what you're supposed to be practicing and yeah i know my friends they like to ask me how i'm sleeping because that's a big warning sign Mm. the less i sleep the more easily irritated i'm gonna be the of course as we all are the less motivated I'm going to be. So I'm going to stop working out, which is something that I enjoy doing. That gives me those endorphins. That just gives me something to do at night. So I'm not overthinking or in the morning, um, the less I'm going to, the more I'm going to isolate because I'm just so tired. I don't really want to be around people and having to have conversations because my mind can't do it. So usually sleep is a big one for them and me to recognize like this is not going to go well. We're all on standby. What can we do? <laughs> Please get some sleep. So so you had me on your podcast a while back, which thank you so much. Um, I I just I adore you and I adore your your Instagram. Is is that your grandmother that you Yes. I no, guess, no, like, isn't she so cute? Oh, I love your guys' relationship. It's so amazing. But uh but I don't know much about your story and how you got into mental health advocating and podcasting. And so I'm assuming you have life experience in some of the stuff. And so if you don't mind, could you uh, kind of fill me in that, that way? So my mental health journey started as a child. I, the earliest I remember is being five and being a competitive cheerleader. And they had us in five. Yeah. And they had us in those tiny uniforms back then. That's like a not allowed anymore. Thankfully. But back then they did and my tummy hung over my skirt and like I was five and my my sister made a joke about it and she didn't mean it in like a malicious way. Just like an older sister just jokes with her younger sister. Mm -hmm. But there were so many like TV shows and movies and I don't know where I watched them, but that messaging that a cheerleader needed to be small and skinny and I wanted to be a flyer. And then what if I'm too big to be a flyer? And just all these kind of overwhelming, ruminating thoughts came into my head. And I started to feel really ashamed, I would say is the word. And I just kind of questioned everything, you know, and feeling afraid to grow, which is not something you should fear at five years old because you're going to grow. Like you cannot prevent that. You shouldn't try to prevent that. Um, <laughs> Yet, I was so terrified of it, and it kind of continued to develop. So I remember being eight, and my friend and I comparing our weights and her being like, well, our head out adds eight pounds or something, and us trying to calculate how we can make ourselves tinier with numbers. And it just it started so young, and by the time I was nine years old, I wasn't really eating much. I would have like a piece of grilled chicken maybe during the day. I wouldn't eat the food my mom gave me because I just, I wanted to be small enough and I was kept growing and I was so afraid and it kind of just developed in my head this constant fear. And then it developed into not even the sphere of being small enough, but this overall good enough. So then in my grades had to be perfect. I had to be good enough as a student. I had to be good enough in popularity wise and have enough friends and be funny enough and cool enough. And it was just this constant trying to reach these ideas of enough But there was no measure to enough, first of all. So it just became this giant insecurity in every aspect of my life. And the messaging I was telling myself is you're not enough. And measuring my self-worth based on things that weren't really measurable. Mm -hmm. And that became really difficult. So by the time I was 12, I started a blog. I called it Inspiring My Generation, which is why the nonprofits named that. And it was about just... First, I started as quotes that I would write or I'd find quotes I really liked and then I'd add something to them or take something away to like make it my own and make it resonate with me. So I would post that. I actually walked around with like 
book of quotes um, that I had put together and had like all these little designs. I took it everywhere with me. I loved it. So I had, <laughs> in, in conclusion, um, I had this quotes that I would love to put on the blog. And then I would start to do little life lessons that I was learning away around learning along the way. And I remember this one was about, you know, I was looking at, I was doing a homework assignment in pen, even though the teacher said, oh, you should probably use pencil so you can erase. It was a math assignment. And like it hit me in my head for some reason that, um, you know, life doesn't have to be so permanent. It's some, you can make mistakes and erase it. So I wrote a blog about that. And it kind of just kept growing into these life lessons I learned or things that were inspiring me. And then when I turned 15, I was like, people kind of teasing me about it. And I was like, maybe people just aren't hearing me. I really want to talk about this. I love Oprah Winfrey. I'm convinced I'm going to be the next <laughs> Oprah. What can I do? So I started, it was called Blog Talk Radio back then. Podcasting wasn't a thing yet. And um, I tried to talk about it more and talk about the importance of driving safe because we were all getting ready to start driving everyone thought it was cool to race and see how fast you could go and making memories with your family and your loved ones and being a nice friend and how your words matter and it was just all these conversations that was really meant to kind of just inspire people and i knew i always wanted to do something with that my high school career file said wants to be oprah winfrey my advisor hated me because that was what i gave her as my career it's like please <laughs> your real job i was like Oprah. So I, I, I felt so bad for her now. <laughs> Oprah won't help me. Um, she had to put something like in there that did not say Oprah, but it's fine. So you know, I've interviewed Oprah a few times. Have you really? No, that was a oh. lie. I'm sorry. <laughs> you can't joke about that. I, was like, <laughs> <laughs> I, I love Oprah. Okay. So back to my story. Um, and so I talked about it and then podcasting wasn't a thing, blogging wasn't a thing. So what do high schoolers do? They make fun of you for it. And in the midst of that, my parents were separating and I felt like it was my fault because that's what kids like to tell ourselves, right? And then I wasn't good enough at making friends because people were making fun of me and teasing me. And I wasn't getting straight A's all the time. I was taking like AP Calc and my teacher made those tests pretty hard. So wasn't always getting 100. And suddenly I'm not smart enough. And then all these enoughs, I'm not thin enough. I'm just, it became overwhelming again. And I didn't really have any tools to cope with it or recognize what was happening or do anything about it. And anytime I tried to talk about what I was going through or talk about helping people, people made fun of me. So I started to shut down, internalize all of it went off to college thinking, you know, life's going to get better. Because, you know, when you don't do anything to support your mental health, and it's declining, just going to college just suddenly with all these new stressors is going to make it all go away, of course. <laughs> so that didn't happen. Surprise. And I was getting ready to graduate. And I was going to graduate early to prove I was good enough and smart enough because, oh, so I was graduating in two and a half years. And to do that, I didn't really sleep. I didn't take care of myself at all. I wasn't really eating well. The real support system I had at the time were my grandparents and my aunt and uncle because my parents were still going through their divorce and they didn't have the emotional capacity to be there for themselves, let alone me at that point in time. So I was very grateful. My grandfather would FaceTime me three times a day, every morning for a cup of coffee after class while I walked home and I'd tell him about it and every night for dinner. Um, my grandmother, if I was on the phone with him, I was on the phone with her. My aunt and uncle like picked me up for family game nights and movie nights whenever I was in town. They were just the support system I had. And it was amazing. So I'm getting ready to graduate three weeks before graduation, the week of final exams. It was coming up to Thanksgiving. My grandparents get into a car accident and I lose my grandfather. I almost lose my grandmother. I actually miss half of my finals and go sleep in a hospital chair next to my grandmother. Thankfully, my teachers either just passed me through it or allowed me to take it virtually. And I was able to graduate, but I slept in a hospital chair next to my grandmother. My mental health has already been declining this whole time. And now I have to grieve. I don't know what grieving is or how to grieve, but I'm... 20 years old and sleeping in a hospital chair next to my grandmother, not knowing what to do or what to say, and everything feels overwhelmed. It's just getting worse, and I don't know how to take care of myself. So Christmas Eve, Vodka. Over. <laughs> I 
I wasn't 21 yet. Oh, right, right. See, 19 here, so. Oh, okay. <laughs> anyway. You're 21. <laughs> um, so. It, it, it does work very temporarily, and it actually makes matters a worse. Yeah, right. Um, yeah. I don't suggest it. So, anyway, sorry. So, <laughs> other than spiking my drinks, um, <laughs> I, I had to learn something to do and I didn't know what to do and it just got overwhelming. So Christmas Eve rolled around and rolled around, not ruled, rolled around and <laughs> made girl women with language today. Um, and I didn't know what to do or how to cope. And it just really hit me that my grandfather wasn't here anymore in a day where we used to lay in bed and watch the Grinch and eat hot chocolate, drink, not drink, drink cappuccinos, eat a piece of dark chocolate every Christmas Eve morning. And suddenly that was never going to happen again. My heart shattered. Everything became too overwhelming. I attempted suicide Christmas Eve. My uncle was the one who helped me do it. 27 days later, I lost him to suicide. person who had a conversation with me and helped me suddenly wasn't here because he was going through something very similar to what I was going through. And I didn't know. And I didn't recognize. And I didn't save him. And I wasn't good enough. And that was the messaging going through my head. Was your grandpa his father? Yes. Yes. So he lost his dad. Yes. Helped you through a suicide attempt. And then he took his own life. 27 days later. Yep. Oh, my God. So I uh, went to my master's program, moved in with my aunt and younger cousins, trying to take care of them. Still haven't grieved. Still haven't learned anything to do to take care of myself. Didn't realize there were things I needed to do yet at that point. Attempted two more times. Hospitalized in a psych ward. Saw how many other people were struggling and realized that People needed a conversation. People needed to feel not alone. We needed tools to learn how to deal with this and to recognize recognize this before we were in a psych ward. And I was like, I gotta do something about it. So I uh, spent a year doing everything I could to care for myself. I was very privileged and fortunate to have access to so much treatment options. So I had therapy four times a week. And for a while, for like 10 weeks, yeah, very, very lucky. Um, my dad in the beginning would force me to go there and he would just sit in the waiting room. And if I didn't want to go in, I was stuck there. I wasn't allowed to go anywhere. So I kind of had to go. And then I looked forward to going. And then I got to a place where I was like, okay, I want to do something. So inspiring my generation, this blog, I posted again for the first time in years, my story. People responded so kindly to it, which I was very surprised because one person sent me this like nasty message. How could I ever do this? I'm reading my life by talking about it. And then everyone else was so kind you know, and they had resonated or they knew someone. And I was like, okay, so this is the stigma and the fear of talking. And then this is what happens when we don't talk. So I took that blog and turned it into a 501c3. And now it's a nonprofit. Amazing. Uh, being Canadian, I don't know what a, a, a 5.1c3 is. So that's um, <laughs> right. Or whatever you so said. That is 501c3. It's a registered nonprofit organization in the United States of America. Oh, oh! I thought that was some kind of uh, droid from Star Wars. <laughs> that would be much cooler. <laughs> Maybe you could go collect some donations for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there you go. Well, that's AI, I guess. Now that's amazing uh, that that you were able to you know, turn your pain into, into something amazing. Um, and, and plus you have the, your podcast, which I guess is that part of the, the nonprofit. Yeah. So it's actually one of our initiatives. We have three main initiatives. The first one is the podcast. It's called normalize the conversation. So it's really a place to not just normalize the conversation, but normalize a range of conversations because it's not enough to just talk about mental health, but Let's talk about resources. Let's talk about warning signs. Let's talk about how you find a therapist that's right for you. All these different pieces of information I never knew I needed Mm -hmm. and would have been so much helpful because you can tell me to go to therapy and go to therapy and then I go and it's not a right fit for me. And I think, oh my goodness, therapy doesn't work. Or Right? So Mm -hmm. I knew that there are questions I could ask and that sometimes it takes a while to find the right therapist. It kind of changes the perception of what therapy is and doesn't make it it's all about me and I'm the problem and I'm never going to get better. 
So really creating those kinds of conversations. The second piece is our encouragement card program. Um, That one might Uh, be my favorite because when I was in the psych ward, it was so beige and dull and boring and just it honestly what I would imagine a prison to feel like. And that might be a strong way to describe it, but there were bars on the windows. You couldn't go outside. You were kind of stuck with a bunch of people who were scared as well and going through and don't want to talk about it. And you couldn't use the restroom without, with the closed door, right? You couldn't shower without someone there. You didn't have access to a lot of things. People could only visit you during certain hours. So that's what I imagine it would feel like being in a prison in a way. And that was really, really dark and scary for me. I was 20 years old, terrified out of my mind. And um, I wish that someone sent me something that was kind of full of color and happiness. So the encouragement cards are my way of bringing like color and hope and smiles into the psych wards at that critical time where everything looks as dark as it feels inside. And then the last piece is the education component. And that is the... Someone else at the door? Yeah, sorry. So my grandmother has Alzheimer's. And although there's oh, a note okay. on the door that says I'm recording and 10 text, we're still going to knock. But she's good. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I'm recording. What? I'm recording a podcast. Oh. I don't know, like 30 minutes. Oh, okay. So sorry. Um, don't be. Yeah, this, honestly, this isn't the first time that a loved one with Alzheimer's inter- or kind of in- interrupted a uh, an interview. So, you know, it's, there you go. It's great because like, she's so cute and I love her. And like, I know she cannot process the fact that I'm in the middle of doing something. However, it's also like 10,000 text messages, um, phone calls, reminders, alerts on her calendar, notes on the door. <laughs> And yet, we're still like, hmm, let's knock. So I know it's not <laughs> but sometimes it's like, you did everything you could, and yet, it's, but you know, it is what it is. Yeah, so yeah. the, um, she's still knocking. So the <laughs> workshop, the um, education component is about taking these tools and worksheets that I created and turning them into workshops and I offer them for free to teens and young adults through local libraries, um, virtual and in person to really create that gap in education on tools I needed back then. So every month I personally, or every month, every year, I wish it was every month, every year I publish (laughs) a workbook that I've created based on the skill and tool I'm working on for myself at that point in time. So right now I'm working on boundaries. So that's 2025 workbook. And I've taken those workbooks and then turned them into these workshops and hopefully those tools help others. And that is the nonprofits program. Amazing. Amazing. That's incredible. Uh, you, you've got a lot of energy. Yeah, sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I can relate with a lot of what you're saying. Um, and I, you know, I don't know if you remember some of the stuff I said when I was on your podcast, but yeah, being in the psych ward and just that whole, I mean, I was in my mid thirties and I was terrified and it was very prison. Like, um, even my high school experience was, you know, a lot of teasing because uh, for whatever reason I was different than other kids. It sounds like you were almost like, like you, you hear people say, Oh, you're an old soul. Like you were like in high school, you, you sound like you're already a, like a 60 year old, with wise kind of I don't know you know what I mean yeah I was very I feel like mature is a strong word because I don't know if mature is the word my parents would use but I was very <laughs> they're like no um but I was very much like future oriented whereas most kids are worried about the party they were going to that night I was worried about how I could make an impact and what I could do and what I could talk about and the kind of legacy you leave behind. So I was very much, I guess, like a 40 year old, maybe, maybe a 50 year old. stuff. That's what my dad's (laughs) thinking about now. So I'm going to say 50 year old. I'm like a 50 year old stuck in a 16 year old's body. Hmm. And is that why 
people were making fun of you. Like you were, cause they're like, what? Like, I, I guess it would be, it's not common for someone in their teens, especially how old are you now? 20, I mid-20s? am 25. Yeah. Right. So 10 years ago, especially a 15 year old talking about mental health and trying to do all yeah. this stuff there. Yeah. So the, the people like look at you at like you were weird. <laughs> Is that what I it mean, was? Yeah, I would say they definitely judged me for the blog and the podcast. But I think more so I was very, I don't like to use the word, but like every mm, thinking how I'm going to word it. People saw me as dramatic because I would respond very easily with tears. I would get very, I don't use the word emotional because I feel like it's so, there's such a negative connotation to it. But I was very in touch with my emotions to where something that seemed small, that felt big for me, I would cry. And I just happened to cry a lot and I'd get really anxious and I couldn't catch my breath. And these were all physical manifestations of depression and anxiety, but no one knew that. And I didn't know that. So instead it was, oh, Francesca's just dramatic. Francesca's seeking attention. Francesca's crying again. Mm. And I think that led to a lot of the teasing. And then Francesca's either crying or writing a blog. What's a blog? So, or (laughs) doing a podcast. So I definitely think I, who I was and what I was going through made it easy for them to find something to make fun of because it was just not what everyone else was doing. Other people Mm. were like laughing and drinking and smoking and going out and partying. And I was like in tears or writing a blog on the floor of my room with my stuffed animals. (laughs) Right. Right. And and for me being a male in a small town, uh, Canada, it was like, well, especially my family, uh, instead of tears, we hit it behind like anger and that's much more accepted. Like people are just like, Oh, that guy's grumpy or, you know, for whatever reason, it's more because it's intimidating maybe as opposed to um, being emotional or dramatic. It's just like, Oh, that guy is, I don't know. There's so many angry guys around (laughs) that it's just more acceptable. That's the societal expectation for what a female versus a male should respond and how our emotions should be presented. For men, it's okay for them to be, it's expected for them to be angry and be aggressive. And that's kind of what we idealize as appropriate behavior. And then for women, they're emotional and they're, they should be quiet and shy and reserved and do what they're told. And for men, when they're upset, it's, and they're saying what they want, they're assertive. But a woman's upset and she's crying and asking for what she wants, she's weak. So, and mm. in both scenarios, they need support. They need someone to listen to them to validate what they're going through and to help them develop tools to manage it. Neither situation is great. Everyone needs tools and support and conversation and validation. So it's funny how society is idealized, like two completely opposite reactions and made those like normal to the typical gender roles and never talking about how like everyone just needs to feel validated, to feel supported and have some thing to help them through it, whether it's learning to manage day to day so that the tears aren't impacting their daily functioning or manage that anger. So it's not impacting their daily functioning as well. Mm-hmm. It, it, it took me long. Well, I actually it took me, getting sober really to even realize that the anger issues I was having were actually, it was actually, um, anxiety and depression. And, and, you know, that's just how it was manifesting was anger. Mm -hmm. You know, I just thought I was grumpy or something, you know, I thought I had a short temper when in fact I, uh, yeah, I was suffering through mental health issues. Um, and I, I, I think that's something that young men should, uh, maybe, well, I don't know what I'm trying to say here. So now I'm trying to come up with the right wording too. It's like, I just wish that people could be, could process their feelings better and like be able to sit and like, okay, I'm behaving this way, but what is my actual emotion that's creating me to, to do these behaviors, you know? And it took being in addiction to tr- treatment with like there's the, what are the, the feeling wheel or the emotions wheel, you know, and it, 
man, I, I, that was so good. I kept being told like, you have to learn how to feel. And I was like, I know how to feel like, what are you talking about? But I really didn't like, I knew how to feel, but I didn't know how to process the feelings and to like label what I'm feeling. That was the part that was hard. And then once you do that, then, you know, the easier part is, okay, now that I know what the hell I'm feeling, (laughs) how do I behave appropriately? Yes. How do I learn how to manage it? And being able to identify, that's a big one because identify. Good it, may feel, <laughs> it may feel like anger, but it's actually frustration or I'm overwhelmed. It may feel like sadness, but I'm actually feeling really hopeless right now. Being able to identify the difference is huge because then you know I am frustrated because I'm overwhelmed with the amount of tasks on my plate and I need to work on some time management and boundaries. That would really help me right now versus I'm feeling angry because of a situation that happened and I need to be able to cool down, collect my thoughts and communicate with someone else and kind of repair or make a change. Um, But I'm feeling really hopeless. I need to find something to help me keep going. I need to maybe have a conversation and get support now and treatment ASAP. So being able to identify the difference helps you figure out what actual tools you need instead of just making this assumption that I'm mad, so I need to punch a pillow or I'm sad, so I just need to cry. And you might just need to punch a pillow or you might need to cry, but there also may be something underlining happening. And when you're able to identify and really process what you're going through, you can begin to work toward healing it. Mm-hmm. So Sunday, you scheduled a depressant episode. Uh, <laughs> do you do you recognize, I mean, you're obviously self-aware enough to know what, you know, that you're feeling this way. Uh, are you able to process and really narrow it down to, to what's going on? Yeah, so I... Um... I will say that I entered into a depressive episode on Sunday. I was out with my grandmother and my younger cousins. And because my grandmother has Alzheimer's, she and I'm what she perceives as her kind of evil person who makes her take her medicine and eat healthy and doesn't let her eat a whole cake for dinner and makes her wear her hearing aids and tells her where she has to take a bath. Like I'm, you know, I'm that mom figure honestly Mm -hmm. and she doesn't like it because she thinks she's an independent adult and there's that disconnect so she sees me as evil and then she sees my younger cousins who she who she speaking of evil (laughs) she Um, heard you (laughs) who she sees as so she sees them every once in a while but they're so amazing because they're so nice and they love her so much and i'm the one with the door locked So it's a very, it gets very overwhelming when she kind of sees them and and it's like, they're so amazing. Why are you so mean? I hate you. You're trying to kill me. Like all these phrases coming at me and someone else who's barely there, who doesn't show up in any way, shape or form other than the occasional, I will pay for you to have breakfast. Um, Clearly I'm I'm upset. Um, They're just not as present and... I mean, and also they're younger. They're younger. I give them credit for that. Um, and it just gets really frustrating and overwhelming. And then I internalize all of it and I feel so guilty. And how can I let this happen that she may- thinks I'm so evil? Why am I so bad? And just all these things. And it gets overwhelming because a few weeks ago I was traveling across the country every week. So I was here and a caregiver, but then I was also a student and a mental health advocate. And they were separate people and everything was great. And I had that escape. But now I'm in it kind of full time and I don't have that escape, but it's just a lot more difficult. And I clearly did not um, utilize tools to prevent that. I knew it was going to happen, um, but I should have done more or, you know, in hindsight, it's 2020, um, which I feel like is a terrible phrase now that we saw 2020. But <laughs> I should have done something. Wish I had thought to do something. Don't know what I could have done really to prevent it. Um, <gasps> Vodka. But, um, Oh, no, wait. No, sorry. No, I'm I'm not legal age. Um, But (laughs) so instead of vodka, I um, entered into a press episode and called my friends. I actually texted them. I was like, I 
really need someone. Is anyone available? And then no one answered. I'm like, please answer. No one answered. So I called them and my friend was in the middle of a nap and she was like, I will be right there. And then my other friend was like, I'm an hour and a half away, but I can be there soon. So um, one of them ended up coming and it make the one who was an hour and a half drive here. Um, but the other one was 30 minutes. She could do it. So she came and just hung out. <laughs> not that far um it just hung out with me for a little bit and made me not feel alone and that was really great but it's just I knew what was going to trigger it I put myself in the situation to trigger it and yet I'm like so surprised by it I mean I did it to myself well I I mean that's a tough position I I've I've done episodes on caregivers before because it's a it's a real role, for, you know, especially if it's a loved one. Maybe not so much if you're, you know, you're hired to come be a caregiver. But um, so I mean, it's it's a very hard role. Uh, so I I I I challenge you to think that instead of it's. I mean, no, I'm no expert. I'm not. This is just me talking. Um, I have a feeling that your younger cousin, who who maybe you're feeling a little. I know like it's unreasonable resentment maybe because she's, you know, she looks like the golden child and you look terrible, but she's probably looking up to you and it's so grateful for you to, to be the one taking care of grandmother. You're the one kind of sacrificing your time and your energy and your, your mental health, your sleep, taking care of, of grandma or aunt or whatever the relationship is. And so I, 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 yeah, I, I but it's so hard when the person you're taking care of, the person, yeah, the person you are taking care of, is calling you evil and names and all this stuff. But yeah. um, I, I, you have nothing but respect for me because I have a hard time taking care of myself. I can't imagine taking care of my grandmother. So not um, doing either, honestly. But you're right, and with my cousin she's younger she um and you know what in your teens your top priority is usually not let me hang out with grandma number one credit for that vlogging um (laughs) (laughs) i was like vlogging and hanging out with my grandmother all the time it's always with my grandparents so it's just a different nature of the relationship and a lot of it is me feeling kind of jealous that my cousins get to be granddaughters they get to be a granddaughter and i don't get to be perceived as that anymore so it's comparison is the thief of joy yes it really is and it stems from a lot of jealousy that i don't get to be the golden granddaughter i am instead the evil queen you know dictating that you have to wear your hearing aids and take your medicine and take a shower with soap (laughs) (laughs) wait you guys use soap down there you know not really Sometimes just spray some perfume, maybe jump in the pool. It's the same thing. Dry shampoo. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. Yeah. I don't. I don't envy your position at all. But uh, you'd be surprised how many people in your family may even be jealous of you. That you know that you get to spend so much time be- with grandma before she goes, and all these things. And yeah. yeah. Again, and that's that's the the thief of joy of comparison. It's. Yeah. Yeah. So I want to ask you, do you, do you suspect at all that you may be neurodivergent or ADHD here? So no, I, um, my brother lives with ADHD and, um, I've talked to my doctors about it and no, I have a very hyper personality, but I don't have any attention deficit. I'm very good at focusing in. So they don't suspect ADHD. They just think that my brain likes to go everywhere all at once and I need to learn. What to about focus autist- What about autistic spectrum? No. So again, no? I've talked to my doctors and based on assessments and tests, they think that it's more depression and anxiety. Um, bipolar two disorder is really where they've landed with anxious features. Um, oh, okay. Yes. So you have been diagnosed with something. I do have a diagnosis. It's bipolar 2 with anxious features. Uh, I know I've been told before. I forget every time. Can you quickly give me 
the breakdown of the difference between bipolar one, two, and I think there's a third one. It's like combo. Yeah, cyclothymia. Um, so I can do one and two very well. Um, okay. The third one I'm not too educated in, which I should be as a psych um, master's student. But uh, next semester. My, next semester. Bipolar one and two, they're very similar in the sense that you kind of have these cycles. In bipolar one, the ups are called mania, and in bipolar two, it's called hypomania. So mania lasts usually more than seven days, and it's very, very up. So usually that might look like um, gambling, more risky behaviors, drinking a lot more, engaging in risky sexual behaviors. So it's all about those like risky behaviors. And for bipolar one, that's mania that lasts up about seven days or more. For bipolar two disorder, it's called hypomania. And although you may experience the same type of highs, because they don't last more than four days, they don't get as severe, um, typically. Mm, and then gotcha. both of them can also have the depression, the depressive episodes, but you do not have to have depressive episodes to um, to meet the criteria for bipolar one versus bipolar two. You do have to also experience depressive episodes. So for me, I experience hypomania and then depressive episodes. Mine are usually depressive episodes. Every once in a while, I might hit a hypomania. And for me, that looks like I talk very, 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 very fast. And I have so much energy. I will stay up all night and write a workbook. And I'm just so productive. And I'll start a million different tasks and won't sleep at all. So for me, hypomania looks like an intense level of productivity and um, high, high, high energy, which... I already naturally have high energy, so it's a lot. It's really fun <laughs> on my end, by the way. So for me, it's so oh. fun. Yes, because I am super happy. I'm so confident in myself. I'm getting so much done. It's kind of when I come out of it that I realize, oh, that was not supposed to be super fun. Or maybe it was, but <laughs> it was actually an episode. And it's a good time to check in with my therapist. And let her know and see if my psychiatrist wants to change any medication or if everything's good, if I'm coping and kind of coming out of it without hitting that low depressive episode as a result. I wonder, uh, as, uh, being your grandmother, kind of having a caregiver that's going through these ups and downs, if that's frustrating for her or if it's just, you know, with, with her, what she's going through is just all the same anyway. So no, she recognizes it. And yeah. I think, mm. so it usually starts with irritability. So that's really hard for her because she's easily agitated with Alzheimer's. Um, it's very, very common. And mm. when I'm not able to be patient back and I'm just as agitated, you know, she gets upset because she's like, why are you being mean to me? And I'm like, I'm not trying to be mean to you. Why are you being mean to me? And neither one of us means to be mean. She just has Alzheimer's and I am entering into a depressive episode. Um, so for that, it's just very, very difficult for us to get along, which is really hard because all we want to do is literally be there for each other. And then the second part of it is when I hit those depressive episodes, she knows something's wrong, but she doesn't know what it is, but she like has this innate sense in her, like her spidey senses are tingling. Something is wrong and Francesca needs help. So she will, um, blow up my phone a million and one times. Are you okay? What's wrong? Something's wrong. Um, she'll come and lay in my bed and just like rub my back. Like, what's wrong? What can I do? Can I make you tea? So she like does have that very much grandmother instinct in her. And she does recognize it even if I think I'm hiding it. And I might be able to hide it to other people. She she just knows. But we were always so close. And she's just, she knows me. So, mm. but it does impact her because it worries this her. Like a, this sounds like a great sitcom. I keep telling people that there should be. I'm so excited about this. <laughs> I, I should have a camera crew following me. Make, make, like a sitcom would be funny, but also it's a reality <laughs> show. I don't know. But I should have camera yeah. crews following me. I tell people this all the time because I think I'm so entertaining. <laughs> <laughs> I'm convinced I would watch a reality show about my life. Are you sure you don't have ADHD? <laughs> <laughs> I'm so entertaining. Yeah. Uh, no, I, I uh, really think I'm entertaining and it's probably an inflated <laughs> ego. 
Um, but <laughs> <It> could be. <laughs> Even when I'm depressed, I'm entertaining. <laughs> <laughs> so, but you know what? If I had camera crews following me around and then I got to watch, I would see if I'm really as entertaining as I think I am. <laughs> right, which might spark a depressive episode again. <laughs> or like, oh, some I'm boring as shit. Depending on how it goes. <laughs> yeah. uh, well, let's make that happen. <laughs> Someone so you call and I me. Somehow. Hollywood, let me know. <laughs> I guess you could just go on Facebook Live and just never turn it off. Or no, <laughs> yeah. is that even a thing anymore? Facebook Live? TikTok? I don't know. I don't I have don't Facebook. So oh, you don't? Oh, that's no, an old I, person thing. Yeah. No, so I <laughs> I mean, yes, but I de- <laughs> everyone's <laughs> on it. Um, no, I deleted it when my account got like hacked and then Facebook wouldn't let me recover my account. And I was like, I don't even use your app. Just let me have my account back. So I got mad. I was like, delete <laughs> that's just as well instagram's funner anyway right it is and here's the thing about instagram it's like on facebook it's all these old pictures that your mom posted that are haunting you forever and it's like you can't delete them (laughs) on instagram you can just untag yourself from them you can archive it delete it you can get rid of it you know it's content that you put out there that you're like hmm I don't like the way I look anymore. Let me delete that. Or that's not as cool as I thought it was. Um, so that's what I like about Instagram. It doesn't feel as permanent versus my mom's like photo wall on Facebook. It feels <laughs> oh, never ending. Well, that I find Instagram like less political and less like bullyish and less opinions. And it's just like goofy pictures. And it depends and on what accounts you follow. That's I, I guess, yeah, it depends on the algorithm that, yeah, you've kind of set up for yourself in a way. Yeah, mine's mostly like memes and mental health. <laughs> I love that. Mine is mental health, um, a lot of Taylor Swift, of course, and then, um, as it should be, and then Taylor politics. Swift and Oprah. Taylor Swift and Oprah, and then mine's very, I like to follow what's happening on both sides and really see I'm a big, big advocate for like knowing both sides and making mm-hmm. informed decisions when you go to vote and knowing who's on your ballot, which most people don't. They only know like president versus vice president. So for me, I love to be very, very informed. So unfortunately, mine's probably as political as Facebook's profiles are, but it's not like random people just going on and fighting with each other. It's like verified accounts that have accurate information that help me stay informed. I turned off my notifications so I don't get notified at all. So sometimes people get mad that I don't answer the messages right away. I'm never ignoring anyone. I just genuinely um, don't have notifications on, so I usually don't see it. Um, secondly, I um, I try to always, if I see someone who I know's post, I try to always like comment and like it and be supportive because I know that that's what I would want when I'm sharing something vulnerable or just sharing something about my life, I want to feel supported. So I kind of try to do that for my friends. That way I get to, even if I don't feel supported that day, I get to offer that kindness to someone else. And then the third piece is I have a private account that's for my friends and family. That is usually the account I'm actually checking. So that's the account that I'm usually squirreling on so it's only people that i personally know that i really really want to know what's happening in every aspect of their life not that i don't care about every human being i really do but Mm -hmm. the people whose maybe days i really want to be part of my day and that's what i usually scroll on and then my public profile i um i like to go on update my stories and try to message back and forth with people but i really don't open that app that like account for very long because it does take a toll on me. Hmm, hmm, hmm. I'm assuming I'm not on your, your private one. I'm following you your public on one. Private I'm one? <laughs> I don't, I don't mind, but I'm assuming the one that I'm following is. It's the is public one. Public. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Because I mean, because <laughs> <laughs> right, what, you know, you were talking about, um, you know, not feeling good since Sunday and you wouldn't know that if you've only followed your public one because there's pictures of your grandma and stuff and you guys hanging out and wait no that's not true because oh on sunday i posted a picture of 
Um, I posted a picture because I know this because I got people were mean to me about it. I posted a picture of me like on my best friend's arm, like with tears in my eyes. And I was like, like, thank you for showing up for me. And I like posted oh, the you pictures did. with the text. I did, right? See, you okay. would know, kind of. But like you also see all the productive moments happening and all the funny moments happening. So you don't see like the full piece of the darkness. Um, but I did post it and I try to post the real pieces of it i'm not very very good at it all the time but i do try to throw it in so that people know and on my private account right. it's literally just recaps of what i did that week so i <laughs> i i don't know it's your blog cares, but i think that they want to see a picture from every day sure why not i i look at a picture of you every day <laughs> i don't know that sounded weird <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, I probably do. I probably do look at a picture of you every day from the amount of stories you post and stuff. I know I do post a lot. I really do. I feel bad when people are like this girl again. But nah, don't feel bad. You, I swear, you don't post any more than anyone else. And I mean, it's about mental health and stuff generally. So I mean, that's fine. You can't that's post too much about Nona. that. Yeah, yeah. Where in my life? Uh, I, I kind of asked about or talked about a little bit about that kind of posting stuff on social media and you would know what you were actually feeling. And I mean, it's completely up to whoever, but I, I just know people that, especially in addictions, it's like they all they'll post stuff about, Oh, I'm so blessed today and they're doing really well or whatever. And then they're just gone for like a month, two months at a time. And you find out they've relapsed and or whatever, or they're back in the psych ward or whatever. And it's like, but leading up, it's a, it's almost like they're they're overcompensating and trying to fool everybody with these posts, and yeah, it, it's it's heartbreaking in a way. Yes. And I don't know if I don't know if it's good or bad, or if it's just a yeah. thing. It is, and that's why I'm such a huge advocate for showing both sides because we tend to feel like we have to put on this brave face and be happy all the time and show all these great things happening for us because that's what it seems like everyone else is doing. And then when right, we right. are feeling worse and lower, we do tend to overcompensate because we don't want people to know. We don't want people to know and we want to pretend like everything's okay. And it just, it makes it worse. So being honest, it gives people a chance. Like I had this one girl send me the sweetest message. Um, and that was like, I don't know what you need to hear right now, but you're needed and you're loved and you're amazing. It was like something small like that. And I needed that message. It was such a powerful, short message. It was not from someone I'd expect to send me a message, which was even more amazing. Someone I absolutely adore and admire. And that made me feel really good. So by being honest, not only did other people see that like, oh, I'm also going through that and it's okay to reach out for help and I'm not the only one, but also I got that support and validation that I needed. So when, when I, there's been times where I've posted very vulnerable things on social media under my podcast and yeah, you get these amazing people reaching out to you. It's, it's, it's so wonderful. Um, I haven't had Taylor Swift or Oprah reach out yet, but <laughs> some, someday will happen anything else you wanted to add or anything I didn't ask that you wanted to touch on? Other than stop, saying anyway? I'm absolutely amazing and you should follow me on social media and listen to my podcast and read my blog because again, I'm amazing. It's all amazing. 10 out of 10 recommend. Um, <laughs> <laughs> buy your workbooks. Buy my workbooks. Um, no. And just remember to, I just want to end with, remember to reach out for support. You're not alone in it. And thank you, Todd, for giving me this space to come on your podcast. I think you're amazing. I had so much fun recording with you. So this was an absolute pleasure. Be sure to subscribe and to like this video. You can listen on Apple Podcast and Spotify. This is Todd Rennebaum saying, make your beds and take your meds. Keep watching for more interviews with incredible people telling their stories of resilience and adversity with mental health and mental illness.